virtual encyclopedia of aggregate processing solutions, George Sidney's knowledge, combined with his easygoing personality, made him an invaluable resource for crushed stone, sand, and gravel producers over the course of several decades. A man with an eye for detail who's described as smart, hardworking, reliable, and productive, Sidney continuously looked to the future for both the industry and his company. An engineer by trade, a number of products and processes can be traced back to Sidney's ingenuity and organizational skills at McClanahan Corporation. For as one longtime competitor remarks, it's one thing to dream, but you've got to be a leader to get things done. George was that guy. Sidney knew at a young age what he wanted to do. He was passionate about engineering and geology, but a research report he conducted as an adolescent steered him toward engineering studies at Penn State. Lo and behold, McClanahan came calling, giving Sidney the opportunity to live out both of his boyhood dreams. Sidney worked as a design engineer for a few years. He took projects on from start to finish, monitoring them through production while servicing issues in the field. In a hurry, Sidney learned not to make mistakes and to design things simply so they could be easily maintained. Sidney did well in this post, well enough to take on new responsibilities as a sales engineer. He was reluctant to take this on at first, but the transition proved to be the best move of his career. The job not only allowed Sidney to be involved in the design of McClanahan equipment, but to truly learn the application of all of the company's designs. During this period, Sidney also began to take on leadership positions in the greater aggregate industry. At the urging of Roy Rumbaugh, Sidney got involved with the National Stone Association. His organizational skills kept meetings moving, along with the association's business. The association platform also afforded Sidney chances to speak at regional seminars, meet other industry leaders, and impart his knowledge of operations onto those seeking it. Meanwhile, in McClanahan, new opportunities continued to present themselves. Sidney became a vice president and director of engineering in the 1980s. Later, he took on responsibilities as president and COO. Additional products and innovations followed, as did strategic acquisitions that expanded the breadth of the company's products. Sidney also had global ambitions, stretching McClanahan's reach to foreign lands. As a businessman, Sidney did not fear his competitors. Instead, he got to know them, believing their views of the business offered value. Sidney also embraced career aspirants, making regular time to be a mentor. Perfection is a difficult feat to attain, but Sidney continuously went after it. This pursuit over many years won him the respect of many customers, as well as his peers in the greater aggregate industry. I am truly humbled to be here, I have to tell you. And I've had to do an awful lot of reflecting to come up with what to say, you know. I'm usually not in a position where I have trouble thinking of something to say. <laughs> a lot of my family refer to me as uh, some of Clint Eastwood's characters, no filter or at least a limited one. But, uh, but look, you know, I've, I've, I've had to think, you know, about, you know, how, how did I even get here, you know? I can't believe it's been 45 years. But it has been. Of course, I started when I was 15. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, what I came to conclude was, you know, and, and it's this way with all of us, we're all products of her parents. So I got to thinking about that. And you know, I looked at my parents, they were great. They were greatest generation people. If you haven't read that book, you need to read that book. It's a powerful testimony of the people that grew up in that era. I had a mom, a homemaker, Essence of love. 
unconditional love. We used to joke that the kids or the grandkids could burn her house down, which was her prized possession, and she'd stand on the sidewalk and say, but isn't it a nice fire? <laughs> I mean, that's just how she was. And our family was diverse because my dad was tough as nails. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> tough as nails. He uh, was a World War II vet. He landed at Omaha Beach on D-Day. Survived. <laughs> and I hope he wasn't playing the lottery because uh, later he joined up with George Patton and he fought at the Battle of the Bulge and survived. <laughs> so I tell you that because that's how I was raised. I know how to salute at the age of three, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> and he had me boxing proficiently at the age of 10. He was also a boxer. I only ever beat him once, and that was the last time we boxed. <laughs> but I got to watch my parents, and was so impressed with how they loved one another. And it was their happiness that uh, stood out. So, being an engineer, I decided I was going to come up with a formula for being happy. And I got to tell you, I think it's worked. <laughs> you know, my dad taught me some valuable lessons that I've carried with me. Taught me the value of dollar. <clears throat> How many young people today know the value of a dollar? He taught me the value of a 10 or 12 hour workday. I should have mentioned he was self-employed his entire life. Never worked for anybody. He couldn't have worked for anybody. <laughs> he taught me to buy good one time. I'm telling you, these are lessons that I've carried throughout my career. And I've employed them in my career. But back to my formula. Manfred and I, I I've never met the man. But he and I have something in common. Because the number one thing you have to do right in life to be happy, and there are three components of this formula. Number one, you got to get yourself right with God. Just have to. Now, I was a challenge for my parents growing up. But they had me in church every Sunday. Not that I wanted to be there, but I was there because that was just the way it was. But that was good. You know, as much as I disliked it back then, I look back now, that was a good thing. Because out of that, I gained a powerful faith and a belief in the power of prayer. And I have to tell you, that has paid major dividends for me in my career both professionally and personally. I relied on that heavily. Now, <laughs> having said that, I'm looking at an audience here that knows me pretty well. So I don't want to come off like a TV evangelist, because I'm not. Uh, my wife is my rock. She keeps me ground. <laughs> And she gives the best illustration of what I'm all about. And this illustration took place uh, a year or so ago. when I was following her around a store, like I usually do. And she finds this T-shirt. And she says, oh my goodness, I found the perfect T-shirt for you. To which I said, I don't need another T-shirt. She said, oh, baby, you need this T-shirt. 
So she holds it up, and in big letters across the top, it says, I love Jesus, which I do. But underneath it in smaller letters, it said, but I cuss a little. <laughs> and I got to be honest with you, you know, when I hit my toe in the bedpost at night or hit my thumb with a hammer, it may be slightly more than a little. So, that's number one. The number one thing to do in life to be happy. Get yourself right with God. Number two, find the right spouse. Now, I'm not talking about that person you think you want to live with. I'm talking about that person you can't live without. That person that's your best friend. And I did that, you know, in baseball terminology, and Leanne and I are baseball fanatics. I hit a grand slam. I mean, I married way above my pay grade. And anybody who knows Leanne knows she's smarter than me. She's a better athlete than me. That's humbling, I'll tell you. And God knows she's better looking than me. But I got to tell you, <laughs> there is uh, there's one thing we're equal in. And that's the sacrifice made in my career. You know, like so many of you out there, you don't, uh, you don't become successful without sacrifice. I've had plenty of it. Not long ago, I surpassed two million air miles. And, and, and keep in mind, I've been traveling for 45 years, so they just started keeping track of air miles not that long ago. So I'm not sure how many I really have. But that's a lot of time on an airplane, i got to tell you. And that's a lot of time away from home. And that's a lot of missed birthdays, missed anniversaries. We had a string of missed anniversaries. That I don't even want to admit to that. Missed holidays. But that's just how it is. She never complained one time. Not once. Not once. And she deserves this award as much as I do. But you can't be successful in life if you don't sacrifice. I don't care what it is you do. That's the bottom line. And if you don't believe this lady hasn't sacrificed <clears throat> all those times away from home, sometime get her aside and ask her about the four and a half foot black snake that got in our house while I was on a trip that she had to deal with by herself. And no, she wasn't allowed to shoot our radiant floors. <laughs> so she dealt with it. Okay, so number one, get yourself right with God. Number two, find the right spouse. Number three, find a job you love, that you're passionate about. I sure did that. I couldn't make my mind up whether one to do engineering or geology. I've collected rocks since I could walk. My mother reminded me of that when I moved away from home. She told me to take my rocks with me. <laughs> so imagine when I go to work for a company where I can be a design engineer and play with rocks all day. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. And it's been that way my whole career. I've loved every day of my working career. Now, does that mean I haven't had tough times? Seriously? <laughs> You're, you can't be in this business and not have tough times. I spent four days in custody in South America, one of those days in jail. Another time I was robbed at gunpoint in India. 
Those are just talking points later in life. (laughs) They're character builders, I can tell you. You want to talk about praying, Manfred? (laughs) A lot of praying going on in those two cases, I can tell you. (laughs) But that's what you put up with in life. And that's what builds your character. I've had a great career at McClanahan Corporation. What a treasure of a company it is. 185 years next year of continuous family ownership and management. Come on. That's a modern day industrial miracle. With all the acquisitions and mergers going on today, that is amazing. And it's a beautiful organization that's family based and oriented. We take care of our employees. I've had two bosses in my career. One was Roy Rumble. That's who hired me. Some of you may recall Roy. I know Mark Dyster knows him. Great guy. Hard as nails. He was another decorated World War II vet. And he ran the company like that. (laughs) I felt right at home because I thought I was working for my dad again. Seriously, a lot of people had trouble with that. I didn't. It fit me. (laughs) That's all I knew. But then I went to work for Mike McClanahan, who took over for Roy. Mike was totally different from Roy. Mike's a great guy. He's a believer in hiring good people, putting them in the right position, and then getting out of their way. I got to tell you, that fit me perfect. (laughs) Mike and I have have had a great relationship over the years. I can remember when he asked me to manage the company. I asked him, can I make changes? And he gave me an answer. He had given me his entire relationship with me. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you change. Just make sure it works. <laughs> Which, seriously, can you ask for anything better than that? He trusted me enough to know that I wouldn't do something that wouldn't work, or if it didn't work, that I'd, I'd make it work somehow. That brings me to our people. Our people are fantastic, and I know I'm probably biased, but that's okay. I'm the one at the podium. I can be biased. We have great employees, absolutely fantastic employees. As Larry the Cable Guy says, they just get her done, no matter what. You need them to work extra hours to get something out, they work the extra hours. They don't complain about it. They just do it. Not because we force them, it's because they want to do it. They have a passion as well. I retired at the end of the year, and leading up to that, I had numerous people ask me, what are you proud of stuff, you know? That was an easy answer. What I'm proud of stuff are people, and especially those people that I had a hand in hiring. You know, watching them grow, nurture, take on more responsibility, That was so rewarding for me to see. That's a beautiful thing. It truly is. The friends you make in this industry. Wow. I have lifelong friends sitting in this room. (laughs) Some of them are competitors. That's a beautiful thing. I'm here to tell you... I've made a habit of trying to make friends with everybody. You never know what's around the next turn, the next corner. You've got to be friends with your competitors. I've seen some people take the approach that, you know, they want to get the silver cross out when they see a competitor approaching, you know. I've never taken that approach. You've got to be friends with everybody. You don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. 
Think about the industry that we work in. Holy cow. It is a noble and honorable industry. I'm here to tell you. We are a base industry. Everything starts with us. Whether it's construction aggregate or the mining and mineral processing industries, everything starts with us. And I know you have these environmental extremists. I cleaned that up, by the way. <laughs> that truly don't have a clue what we do, how we do it, why we do it, or the value we bring to society. You folks know the value brought to society because you live it every day. You know it. We can be so proud of what we do because it starts with us. Everything. The clothing that we have on this evening. The building that we're in. Everything comes from mining. Everything. So be proud of that. You also need to be proud of the trade associations that represent us. NSSGA, one of the best I've been associated with. I rank them ne right next to SME, Society of Mining Metallurgical Engineers. I've been involved in both these groups for, seems like, ever. <laughs> NSSGA have been involved in since 1987. But these are organizations that represent us to the rest of the world. They fight for us. And yes, we've seen them change. They used to be an education-oriented group. Now they're more political activists. We need to get behind our trade organizations. We truly do. Because they are representing us. So if you're not involved, get involved. Whether it's a state association, a national association like NSSGA or SME, or a local, get involved. And while I'm talking about trade associations, we have a Rock Pack event this week. If you haven't contributed to Rock Pack, Paul, have you contributed? <laughs> You need to consider doing that. I'm told I can't strong arm anybody anymore, but that's okay. Uh, I don't think I need to in this crowd. If you haven't contributed, please do, because you're supporting yourself. You're contributing to yourself. It's important that we get behind events such as this. So let's recap here. <laughs> to be happy. God, spouse, job. Do something you love. Okay? Because if you're happy, I don't care what your status is in life. If you're happy, you're successful. Right? You're successful if you're happy. So... I better put these on so I don't miss anything. So, I better close before Rob pulls the hook out here. Uh, I want to congratulate the other, the other award winners. Uh, I'm honored to be among you. Your history, wow. <laughs> you are truly a wow moment. I want to congratulate the award winners of prior years. I'm honored to be among this group. Truly am. I truly don't feel worthy of it, but I'm glad to be here. Of course, you get an age, you're glad to be anywhere. <laughs> I want to thank the Pitt and Corey and the staff uh, for their foresight in putting a program like this together. I think it was 13 years ago, Rob and his cohorts cornered me at a trade show and said, what do you think about this award? We're thinking about doing this. 
And I said, well, I think it's a great idea. A lot of good people out there that would be deserving. But, but, you have got to tie it to a trade association. Don't, don't run an end run. <laughs> Let's make this a, a cooperative effort. And they're to be congratulated on what they have done in that regard. Pitt and Quarry staff have just done a fabulous job of not just developing this award, but nurturing it and, and guiding it to where it is today. I want to thank my family for the support and sacrifice. It's been great. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> I want to thank the McClanahan family of employees. I'm here to tell you, I would not be standing at this podium if it weren't for the McClanahan family of employees. They're the ones that make it happen. And they're the greatest. I wrote a note here that, you know, I wanted to thank whoever it was that nominated me. Because up to last night I didn't have a clue and then I found out. To which I said, you gotta be kidding me. But I thank that individual. I thank the judges who selected me. And I thank you for your presence this evening and your willingness to put up with listening to me. So, with that, I say thank you and God bless. <coughs>